Today we discuss why the US mortgage sector may well be the trigger for the next financial crisis. And it's not what you think. Hello again, I'm Martin North, Principal Analyst of Digital Finance Analytics. I recently described four scenarios which may impact our local economy, household finances and home prices. At the end of the spectrum is a business as usual scenario where local mortgage rates rise and mortgage stress lifts, thus putting some downward pressure on home prices. At the other end of the spectrum, there was an Armageddon size problem triggered by a global event such as a banking crisis, which hits us locally and triggers a fall in home prices of up to 40%. You can find the link to that blog below. So I wanted to talk further about this Armageddon scenario in the light of a recent Brookings Institute paper entitled Liquidity Crisis in the Mortgage Market. The authors examine the inner workings of the US mortgage market, and this is what they say in the abstract. Quote, we describe in this paper how non-bank mortgage companies are vulnerable to liquidity pressures in both their loan origination and servicing activities. And we document that this sector, in aggregate, appears to have minimal resources to bring to bear in a stress scenario. They make the point that the 2008 crash was triggered by two factors. First, and well known, was poor mortgage lending standards, a crash in home prices, and a significant rise in mortgage delinquencies. The second is the use of sophisticated financial engineering tied specifically to the non-bank sector. But they say the literature has been largely silent on this second factor, and specifically the liquidity vulnerabilities of the short-term loans that funded non-bank mortgage origination in the pre-crisis period, as well as the liquidity pressures that are typical in mortgage servicing when defaults are high. These vulnerabilities in the mortgage market were also not the focus of regulatory tension in the aftermath of the crisis. But this is not just an interesting historical fact, the same is happening today. The paper points out that the post-crisis US mortgage market has two very different pieces. One part of the market, the traditional side, consists of highly regulated banks and other depository institutions that usually handle the three main mortgage functions of origination, funding and servicing themselves. They fund their mortgage originations with deposits or federal home loan bank advances generally service their own loans and either hold the loans in portfolio or securitize them in pools guaranteed by the government national mortgage association jenny may or the government sponsored enterprises the gses of fannie mae and freddie mac however there is also a second part of the mortgage market the non-bank mortgage originators and services which is much less discussed in the literature, but represented almost half of mortgage originations in 2016, up sharply from around 20% in 2007, as shown in this chart. These non-banks also represented close to half of all mortgage originations sold to the GSEs in 2016, as well as 75% of all originations sold to Ginny May. The striking rise in the Ginny May non-bank share appears to have continued in 2017. Data from the Urban Institute pins the non-bank share of Gini originations at 80% in December 2017. Non-banks differ from banks both in the types of mortgages they originate and the types of borrowers they service. In addition to their outsized share of the Federal Housing Administration FHA and the US Department of Veterinary Affairs VA loans, both government mortgage loans that have features such as low down payment options and flexible credit and income guidelines that may make them easier for first time home buyers to obtain. Non banks are also more likely to originate mortgages to minority, low income and lower credit scored borrowers. For example, in 2016, non banks originated 53% of all mortgages, but 64% of mortgages originated to black and Hispanic borrowers. 
and 58% of the mortgages to borrowers living in low or moderate income tracts. Non-bank mortgages are a smaller share of total mortgages outstanding than of new mortgage originations. However, as shown here, in 2016 the dollar volume of mortgages in Gini May pools issued and serviced by non-banks exceeded the corresponding volume for banks. And by the end of 2017, the non-bank share was close to 60%. As a result, non-banks are now the main counterparties for Gini May. Inside Mortgage Finance estimates that the non-bank share of servicing was 38% for Gini Pools and 35% for Freddie Pools at the end of 2017. So, the paper says, of particular importance, these liquidity vulnerabilities are still present in 2018 and arguably the potential for liquidity issues associated with mortgage servicing is even greater than pre-financial crisis. These liquidity issues have become more pressing because the non-bank sector is a larger part of the market than it was pre-crisis, especially for loans securitized in pools with guarantees by Ginny May. The authors quote former Ginny May president Ted Tozer concerning the stress between Ginny May and their non-bank counterparties. Quote, Today, Almost two-thirds of Ginny May guaranteed securities are issued by independent mortgage banks, and independent mortgage bankers are using some of the most sophisticated financial engineering that this industry has ever seen. We are also seeing greater dependence on credit lines, securitization involving multiple players, and more frequent trading of servicing rights. And all of these things have created a new and challenging environment for Ginny May. In other words, the risk is a lot higher and business models of our issues are a lot more complex. Add in sharply higher annual volumes and these risks are amplified many times over. Also, we have depended on sheer luck. Luck that the economy does not fall into recession and increase mortgage delinquencies. Luck that our independent mortgage bankers remain able to access the lines of credit and luck that nothing critical falls through the cracks. Now that's all fine in a stable low interest environment, but of course that is not the reality in which we live. And also, non-bank mortgage providers essentially borrow short and lend long, using warehouse lines of credit from banks to fund mortgages. From 2012 to the third quarter of 2017, commitments on warehouse lines has increased 70%. Of course, if all goes well, a mortgage will be sold quickly into the secondary market, on average around 15 days, and the line will be reduced. Now, the Brookings authors identify three vulnerabilities in the process. Firstly, margin calls due to aging risk, meaning the time it takes the non-bank to sell the loans to a mortgage investor and repurchase the collateral and or mark to market devaluations. Second, rollover risks. And third, covenant violations leading to cancellation of the lines. These vulnerabilities are very real should there be a sudden increase in interest rates or other significant change in the market that causes collateral values to drop. Most non-bank lenders have multiple warehouse lines. However, cross-default provisions will trigger a scramble amongst warehouse lenders for a mortgage originator's assets should it default on one of its lines. And here is the problem. As the author explains, quote, these sources of warehouse credit began to dry up rapidly in the run-up to the financial crisis, as the slowdown in the securitization markets made it difficult for the non-banks to move loan originations off the warehouse lines, and the premiums paid for subprime warehouse loans evaporated. In quarter four of 2006, there were 90 warehouse lenders in the US, with about $200 billion of outstanding committed warehouse lines. However, by quarter two 2008, there were only 40 warehouse lenders with outstanding committed lines of 20 to 25 billion, a decline exceeding 85%. And by March 2009, there were only 10 warehouse lenders in the US. 
in addition, runs on special investment vehicles, or SIVs, led to the collapse of this form of warehouse funding by the end of 2007, and it has not returned as a funding source post-crisis. Mortgage services have liquidity issues because they are required to continue to make payments to investors, tax authorities and insurers if mortgage borrowers quit making payments. And services are eventually reimbursed for these servicing advances, however, they need to finance the advances in the interim. Now here is a chart which shows the relative mortgage affordability in the US. And note the recent uptick and the projection ahead as interest rates rise, as a result of the Fed hiking the cash rate. Ahead, more households will be in difficulty. Now this is happening while debt to income ratios are on the rise and Fannie Mae increased its DTI ceiling from 45% to 50% last July and median FICO scores are dropping. And as we discussed the other day, other prudential measures are being eased in the US, adding fuel to the potential fire. And in addition, this map of FHA and VA loans highlights the potential risk areas across the country. This is significant because, as we said earlier, a high proportion of these loans are aligned with these facilities. And last year, some mortgage services were stressed when hurricane victims were allowed payment forbearance by Ginny May and the GSEs. But that was just a little local difficulty. But these non-banks are vulnerable to macroeconomic shocks, rising interest rates, home price declines and job losses, often with a bare minimum down payment. This could well be the straw which breaks the camel's back, and so trigger the next financial crisis in a replay of 2008. And importantly, in this financially interconnected world, this could create a wave of disruption which could trigger our own local financial Armageddon. This will be a disaster, and yet there is little we can do locally to protect our economy from this tsunami. In addition, we need to be aware of the implications of a growing non-bank sector in Australia, where mortgages are funded from other sources and the same vulnerabilities may exist. APRA put some limits on the major banks offering warehouse facilities for the non-banks, but that is hardly scratching the surface. If you found this useful, please do like the post and add a comment or question. I do read them all. And if you've already subscribed, thank you. I'm really grateful for your support. And if you are yet to subscribe, please do so to receive future alerts. I'm Martin North, Principal at Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for taking the time to watch. Music